trouble, Mikey. All right, so good to see everybody this evening. Glad you're here for our Wednesday night Bible study. We'll have a couple of things to mention here before we get um, started with our class time. Have opportunity if there's updates that you have. Again, we'll keep in mind our uh, pair and our group in um, Thailand. Some of them will be coming back a little earlier than others. We want to uh, keep them in mind. I saw a couple of clips. Some folks had some video and some things that did, things have been going well for them over there. Um, we'll be mindful also of homecoming uh, Sunday. Hopefully you've been able to invite a lot of folks and, uh, and get the word out. And maybe there'll be a uh, time now between now and then you can uh, remind some folks or uh, mention that. Uh, two, to remind everybody that we, you know, we'll do uh, regular service and lunch, then one o'clock uh, service for our afternoon service. So to make sure everybody's aware of that. Um, a couple of uh, folks, Allie's grandmother is in ICU. There's a lady in the community, Jonna Johnson, who's been having strokes that uh, we were wanting uh, to mention uh, for us to be thinking and praying about. And we got a note that um, Johnny Rayburn's brother, Robert Davis, passed away today. Um, and so we have that. Is there um, other mentions, other folks you might want to include while we uh, have these on our mind? Mm-hmm. Fully cleared then. Okay, good. Well, that's wonderful. Glad all that uh, recovery went well, and he's uh, back 100% on that then. Good. So uh, Aunt Lou has got shingles just in time for homecoming. How did y'all plan that? <sighs> Um, well, which is um, odd that come up because uh, Karen just uh, got the second round of her shingles shot, so hopefully she won't deal with that. That uh, has been successful with some folks, and um, most everybody I know that's had it don't ever want to do that again, so we'll be mindful of her. Other things? That's right. Um, John yeah, because Lydia said Justin wouldn't be here tonight. He was going going to pick up uh, John and them at uh, airport. They fly to Atlanta. I Atlanta. I didn't know if they were flying Bobby's back into Nashville. Great, I think uh, Perry and Jordan will still be there for a yeah, little a little bit longer. They'll be coming back um, at a different time. So, okay, that's right. I knew he was going to get them, but that's so he's going to get them now. Then, all right. Um, it is interesting the way this worked out. We, uh, Andy's out of pocket tonight. He told us last week that he had an obligation, and so uh, Lucas was going to fill in for him. And here it ties in right at homecoming, where we're going to be fortunate to have Will and Andrew with us uh, leading singing and doing lessons. And one of the advantages, I guess, of being uh, a guy as old as I am with my gray hair is can remember um, Lucas and all them as these little toddlers running around here and now to see them be able to teach class and to take part in the worship like this and, and it when Nash while working out right here together that's just you always see and you always hope the best you know for all these little ones running around you wonder what they're gonna do and what they're gonna become and then when you see stuff like this it's like yeah you know so it's a, it's a pleasure and blessing tonight to have Lucas covering for class, and then uh, we're looking forward, of course, to, to homecoming and, um, and our folks and visitors there. So it's just wonderful. And uh, I'm glad we're all here tonight uh, to be able to study the Word together. If you would, bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these blessings, uh, so many blessings that we enjoy, the good measure of health that we have and our ability to join together here tonight for our ability to look into your word and study to have this opportunity, have this time that we can uh, bring our minds to a better understanding of your word, to help make us better Christians, to help our faith be stronger and deeper, 
um, that we might understand things better so that we might explain uh, things uh, to help answer questions people might have to uh, reach out to those around us with your word to the truths of your word and to show that it is the um, the way the best way the way um, not that it would keeps us from the troubles of life that we're immune from the the problems but that it guides us show us how to deal with the things of life how that we can cling to one another and strengthen one another and lift each other up to make it through the tough times that we get to share in these times together as we pray for homecoming Sunday when we can spend time with family and friends see folks that we haven't seen in a while we pray your blessings upon this time that we'll have together that we might reach out to uh, to many and that there may be some that um, it may have been a while since they have uh, uh, heard your word or maybe they have been with us and that that maybe they'll um, they want to be back with us all the time and that they'll want to make uh, their relationship right with you we pray for the um, different things that we're doing to outreach into the community and the activities we'll have coming up throughout the summer uh, we pray for all the um, mission works that we have and of course we continue to pray for Perry and all them that are traveling and the work that they're doing with Thailand we thank you that that opportunity was there and that they were able to take it we um, we just thank you so much for these many opportunities we have throughout the world to reach out to others and to help others people we may never meet but that we can make an impact in their lives because of the gospel we thank you for the privilege it is to be Christians and to know why we're here and what we should be doing and and to have that peace of mind and that peace in our heart that we know whatever we face in this life we know uh, what we have in the next life and it makes this uh, makes this tolerable and makes it possible for us to make it through this life together thank you for the church our family here we continue to pray for those of our family who are struggling and in many ways that um, that they might uh, be strengthened that they might be better that the things that they're dealing with in their lives that they can uh, continue to be strong and that we can encourage them and help them in any way possible we uh, thank you so much for those spiritual blessings that you've given us through Christ it's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm not Andy, and you can tell that because I don't have those cool half-moon glasses like he does. And I don't have a suit and those cool ties either. And as a matter of fact, I think I'll just take my glasses off because I've got the opposite problem that Andy does. I can see just fine up close but I can't read that board back there without my glasses on, so we'll just roll this way. You know, <clears throat> with the recent um, changes in Major League Baseball, they've just about eliminated what I think is probably one of the hardest positions to be put in as a baseball player, and that's being a pinch hitter. Um, you know, with the new DH rules all around, we don't see pinch hitters a whole lot in baseball these days. And I say that because um, as a school teacher, I don't really excel at being put in the spot in the lineup with a high pressure situation like this when I'm looking around at many people that are much more qualified to be standing in front of you than I am. But I really appreciate um, Philip and Andy and Doug um, for asking me to teach class tonight and be a part of this and thankful for that opportunity to grow a little bit and thankful to hear some of your wisdom as I have growing up here for the last, uh, it will be 33 years on Friday. So. A uh, long time spent here in these building, in these in these walls, listening to some good commentary from you guys, and I hope we can keep that up tonight as well. Uh, Brother Andy mentioned something last week that I thought might be something we could sort of piggyback off of. Uh, I've not been in this class. I've been in uh, Revelation class with Justin, with some of the other young men over here um, in the Amen corner, and um, you know. Coming in last week, I thought, well, I'll go in there and kind of get a feel for what he's doing, and maybe there's somewhere I can pick up and add to. And the more I sat there last week, I thought, you know, I really just don't need to interject myself into this study because Andy knows where he's going with it, and I'm not sure where Andy's going with it totally, so I'm just going to stay out of that, butt out of that. And we're going to take a little aside tonight into uh, something that he mentioned last week. Last week he was talking about um, the, the, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem 
And some of the very, very strong language that's used with regard to many events in the Bible, the destruction of Jerusalem, along with other things like the coming of the church. And that got me to thinking, you know, what really makes the church great? Uh, it was somewhere along about August of 2009, uh, I was in Jackson, Tennessee with one of my good buddies. That was my freshman year of college, for any of you there to keep in count. And uh, we had gone over to Jackson from Henderson in Tennessee there to do some grocery shopping. And if I remember correctly, we had visited the local Mexican restaurant there, Don Poncho, and ate a burrito that was about this long like college boys do. And then we decided, you know what would be a good idea is if we go over to Chick-fil-A and get us a milkshake after that. And I remember sitting in that line in Chick-fil-A, and you guys probably drive through Cox Creek from time to time and notice how the line is. And it was no different there in Jackson at the time. And I remember my friend Will saying, you know, Chick-fil-A is the second greatest institution on earth next to the church. And we got through that line in about two minutes. I mean, a line that looked like it should have taken 25 or 30 minutes and probably would have anywhere else. We just zipped through that thing. We we're on our way with our peach milkshake and headed back toward Henderson to do something, probably not study. And um, we've laughed about that several times over the years. And I know in recent history, you guys might have seen some of the jokes going around on the Internet about how Chick-fil-A could fix anything. Uh, Chick-fil-A could fix the inflation that we're dealing with, or Chick-fil-A could fix the government, or Chick-fil-A could fix this or that. Because in our society today, even though it's kind of a running joke, we understand that Chick-fil-A has kind of become synonymous with a few things, um, like being fast, being efficient, being friendly, being clean, just kind of sort of having things together. And I thought about that joke and that comment, and I, I thought, well, what is it really that makes the church great? What, what are the characteristics that make the church great? So I've got a few listed here tonight, but I really would appreciate if you guys would help me out. I don't fancy myself as much of a lecturer. Um, oftentimes in class at school, I'll lecture about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we're off to something else, and we might come back in for another 5 or 10 minutes later. But... I uh, appreciate your comments. So I want to open the floor up a little bit tonight. What is it, in your opinion, that makes the church so wonderful, so great, and so awesome? The people in it. People in it, certainly. Um, I look around in this audience tonight, and I see a lot of great people. A lot of very different people. A lot of different roles. A lot of different influences in my life. And like I mentioned earlier, I've had the privilege of sitting at the feet of... Uh, just about every one of you men in here in one way or other, if it's in Bible class or out learning how to fix fences or whatever, um, I've, I've been in close contact with just about every one of you in some capacity, and I, I'm thankful for that. Yes, certainly the people make the church great, and we're going to look at that here in just a little bit. What are some other things that make the church great? Christ built it. Christ built it, the foundation with which it's built on. Yes, Absolutely. Uh, one of the, the cornerstones of what we believe in the church, that Christ put it forth for us. Other comments about what might make the church great and wonderful? You know, it's, it's really interesting, uh, especially those of, the, of us within the Church of Christ. You know, we, we're in search of the, uh, the first century church, right? The, the, what the church was like in the beginning. Restoration. And I, I, feel, like, uh, I feel like if you want to find... A first century like church find a congregation with problems and the interesting thing is, is we all have problems that don't need to go anywhere further than our own right and the wonderful thing about the church is not our problems but how we solve them how we come together to to work under the Lord in the Lord to get through them certainly um, you know uh, it, nothing is great just inherently because there's people in it uh, because there's people involved there's a lot of things in the world they have a lot of people in them, but they're not particularly great things. Um, but the way we can come together to work together to help one another out, to bear one another's burdens, certainly uh, that's a good quality, a good aspect of what can make the church an awesome thing, what, what is so great about it. Any other comments about what makes the church wonderful? Going along with what he was saying, we come from all different backgrounds. And we have our own personal goals. 
but the church creates one main goal for so many different people all over the world who can get together and get behind it and feel relatable to each other. You know, Lucas, it's, it's really amazing to um, be a part of it for a lot of many different reasons. We'll list just a handful tonight. Uh, this is not going to be an exhaustive study by any means. But um, one thing I've noticed traveling is that you can always find a, a group of Christians, well, just about all the time, you can find a group of Christians meeting that are faithfully worshiping uh, God and following the commandments of the New Testament. And if that doesn't encourage you, I don't really know what will. Uh, sometimes we get sort of bogged down in our day-to-day -day lives and we get frustrated with things that we don't see and um, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that we're not in this alone. We're not in this alone in this community. We're not in this alone, certainly in this city um, or this county or this country or in the world. There are a lot of Christians that are together, coming together for that one cause of, of salvation. Yes, very good. I appreciate that. Other comments before we move on here? It's not about I know probably all of us in here that have attended this congregation for any length of time at all can speak to what Dalton's talking about. Um, I think that, well, I shouldn't speak for everyone, but I, I talk to a lot of people here that um, bring that up over and over that, that this congregation has been there for them. Uh, one person I really meant to add in our sick list earlier was Sister Alma Jean Gray. I think she might be getting just a tick worse um, there and, and needing to take some additional medication here. But I was able to uh, take the, the Lord's Supper to her about three weeks ago, I guess it was, on Easter. And uh, that's one thing, if you go visit Sister Grace, she's always going to bring up to you. Uh, is she's going to say that Salem is the greatest congregation, in her opinion, because they helped her through so many hard and difficult times. And that's something that I hope can be said of all congregations, that we help people through tough times, and we, we're there with people and for people through the good times. I know I really have appreciated the prayers uh, over the last couple of years in dealing with uh, the diagnosis of Crohn's and maybe not feeling myself a lot of days, and there's been a lot of days a lot of people have prayed for me, and I have surely been grateful for that as well. Well, if we're going to talk a little bit about what makes the church great, I guess we should just go back to one of the foundational passages where it all started. So if you want to, let's turn over to the book of Acts chapter 2. Andy kind of mentioned some events from Acts chapter 2 last week, and we don't want to rehash all of those, but I want to talk about just, like I said, four or five things that I, I think make the church an awesome and great institution, a great thing to be a part of. Um, so hopefully you can help me think through these things tonight. The first thing that I wrote down, the immediate thing that I thought of about what makes the church great, is the fact that we teach the truth. The unwavering, pure gospel truth. And I turn to Acts chapter 2 to, to look at something here. Because um, in Acts chapter 2, we all know the situation. Um, Peter begins to uh, stand there with the eleven in verse 14. And he lifts up his voice and he addresses them. And he talks about some of those things that Andy mentioned last week about the sun and the moon and the wonders of the heavens and the signs and the blood and the fire and the vapor of smoke and about how that great day of the Lord is here, is at hand. But what I want to focus on a little bit here for a minute and think about with you all is really what Peter says there in verse 22, uh, beginning in verse 22, where he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed at the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death, 
because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he's at my right hand, I may, and I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced, and my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb was with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him, that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ Jesus. He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of all that we are witness, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received him from the Father of the promise of the Holy Spirit, has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make enemies of your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, whom you've crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, one thing that I often think of when I think about the, the greatness of the church is the fact that we love people enough to teach them the truth. And this can be a bit of a touchy subject. Um, you know, people want to, it seems like, just stay away from the truth sometimes if they're afraid it's going to hurt someone's feelings. If they're afraid, there's going to be a conflict, a uh, run-in. We're very non-confrontational people these days in a lot of ways. Um, but if you could make it through listening to me read that passage, I'm not sure that's really what Peter did here. He kind of came in swinging <laughs> in a way. Um, that's, that's, you know, despite the situation here and everything that had just happened, Peter stood up and he told them the truth. Hey, you just crucified Jesus who was the Son of God. And you need to change. You need to repent of these things. You need to get salvation because of your, your deeds. And that's something that I'm not sure a lot of other places are willing to do. And I, I, I'm not sure always that's something that the church is willing to do, is just to stand up and teach the truth. Even in the face of adversity, I mean, you just think about it from Peter's perspective. Here he is standing in front of all these people, and the Scripture plainly tells us that these are the people that just committed this against Jesus. So uh, if I'm Peter and the other 11, I'm thinking, well, I sure hope God's with me here because what I'm about to get up and say might not go over real well. And if they did it to Jesus, you know, what was to stop this group from doing the same thing to these people? They had no idea how this was going to turn out. Turn out. Now you know, of course, we know now that that, that, Jeter, that Peter was speaking from inspiration, and that the Holy Spirit was leading what what he was saying there. So things were working together for him because he loved the Lord. But at the time, I don't think he knew that. So let me ask you a question: Is it acceptable for us to sugarcoat truths? No. Just a simple no. Um, is there a, a right way, a correct way to do this, though? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. These are easy questions, right? We can get these right, yes or no. Um, how should we go about that, then, as, as Christians, in order to maintain the greatness of the church, teaching the truth? What, what are we supposed to do? How can we uh, approach people? I like to turn to 2 Timothy 20 through 26, honestly. You know, we're told to do it like, we're, we're told to carry patience and gentleness and kindness among ourselves. And there's, there's a lot of wisdom in that. It seems when you're trying to, not necessarily shove it down someone's throat, but when you, when you argue about it, when you quarrel, just as we're told not to do, it, it just, it falls upon deaf ears. It's like you're, it's like you're beating against a brick wall. And so... You know, I feel like that's the most important part. You know, if they're going to hear, they're, they're, they're going to hear. If they're not, then they're not. And by being gentle and kind, at least 
that person has somebody they can turn to when they are ready if they are? There's kind of three things, one in particular, that we're going to notice as we move through this list tonight that are going to reappear over and over and over again. And those, those ideas of gentleness, meekness, kindness, and especially love keep reappearing throughout the Scriptures. And that's something that we certainly need to keep in the forefront of our mind. Any other comments about how we should um, share the truth in love? Try to have a conversation. You know, one, there's several times that, that stick out of my mind. Jesus went to the house of Simon, and from people can correct me, and that's fine, but I don't know if Simon's full intent was to be hospitable when he invited Jesus. Because Jesus, frankly, pointed out several things to him. You did not do this when I came in as an honored guest. You did not do this. You did not do this. And part of that was washing feet. Part of that maybe was a holy kiss. Or, you know, there's certain things that you do as host to honor your guest. And that was when the woman came. And Simon was talking under his breath. You know, he knew who this woman was. She was probably a prostitute. He wouldn't be letting her do this. He wouldn't let, you know, as a Jew, he shouldn't be letting her, you know. And Jesus pretty much put him in his place uh, that... She's done everything that you were supposed to do. She washed her feet, my feet, with her tears. And she's done, and part of that, in my mind, the Bible doesn't say, but in my mind, part of those tears was probably Jesus having a conversation with someone and her knowing, I'm guilty of these things. Certainly. Not criticizing her, but in his talk of the kingdom, maybe, she realized, I need this guy. And so sometimes, you know, we're very quick to criticize rather than just converse and, and try to help. We're, we're familiar with this idea. It's not a new concept. There's probably nothing I'll say tonight that's novel to any of you. But um, I think the, the idea of having a relationship with the people um, really makes all the difference. Uh, you know, you can take the biggest, baddest... Um, kid at school, and if I can find some way to talk to that kid about something that he enjoys or show up at his sporting event or, you know, have a conversation with him, not about physics or chemistry or the Bible in this case, um, and then bring him around to some of those ideas, usually goes pretty well. Um, there's, there's a lot that can be said for building that relationship with people. We know in, in that situation, Jesus certainly had a relationship with those people. Um, we think, to the, the first part of the book of Revelation, which we've been talking about in our classes, all those letters to the churches, and nearly every one of them were well aware that there are many critiques of those local congregations, but we know also that there had to, be, had to have been some previous relationship there somehow. So... Um, sort of setting the, the groundwork certainly goes a long way in those things. Good. Thank you for, for helping with that. Any other comments before we sort of move on? All right, well, let's talk about that, that love that we have for one another and the relationships that, that we have one, for one another. And I, I want to make the point that, you know, biblical love is not an option. Um, Loving your brother and sister, loving the non-believer, it's, it's not optional. If you will, turn with me over to the book of 1 John. Let's look at 1 John chapter 4. Verses 20 and 21, this book of 1 John is, is, talks a lot about love in many different aspects. And he points out... Um, in chapter 4, verse 20 and 21, that if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he's not seen. And this is the commandment we, that we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. All right? So this is, is not something that we get the choice of doing. We have to love people whether we like it or not. Um, we have to find a way to love our brothers in the church. We've got to find a way to love the people that are not in the church. 
um, to show love to them. Um, because if, if we don't, um, we are not going to be able to make any of that headway. We're not going to be able to have any of those conversations with them. If we back up in 1 John over to chapter 3, verse 11, again, talking about love, he says, This is the message that you've heard from the very beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Don't be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Who does not love, whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he hath laid down his life for us, that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love the world or talk about it or talk, but in deed and truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and the resurrection of our heart before him. So, you know, it's very clear from the scriptures that we need to love each other and um, we should be taking every opportunity, every um, event to show that love one to another. How can Christians show love to each other? We've mentioned some ways already. person with needs. If someone's not able to provide something for their family or for themselves, a lot of times Christians will step up and help each other out. So just fulfilling basic needs um, of our brothers and sisters. That's certainly one way. Other ways that we can show love one to another. By putting the lives of others above our own. It's, it's living by example, right? Uh, the book of James gives us a lot of, of practical words, and we won't turn and read there, uh, but in James chapter 2, uh, beginning of verse 14, James talks extensively about the relationship of faith and works. And he talks about how a faith without works is dead. Well, again, um, black and white for us, we've got to do things for people. We've got to do things for our brothers. We've got to do things for people that are outside the brotherhood if we expect to win them over to Christ. What we say and what we do has a really, really extreme impact on how the unbelievers view the church and its greatness. And you know, we can sit inside these walls and think about how great we are all day, but if we're not showing that to the people outside of here, then what good is it? Um, we're not really doing our job. Um, thinking about the book of James in chapter 3, he talks a lot about the tongue and how we should be careful about what we say and how what we say may seem like a very small thing. He draws some parallels about a rudder and a sh um, its role in guiding a ship and about how a, a fire can be started from a small spark. Um, we have to be really, 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 really careful about what we say and what we do as well. You know, some things we say and some things we do have unintentional consequences. And we all fall victim to this uh, from time to time. You know, we all say things and it may come out in one way to someone. And it's not the way we meant it at all. It didn't mean any ill will or any ill intent but they take it that way. They take offense to that. Um, but probably more than the things that we say, people learn about us about by watching the things that we do. Um, our actions, you know, speak louder than our words. They, they tell people what we're all about. So we need to be careful and think through everything that we say, everything that we do, especially to our brothers and sisters, and even more especially to unbelievers, because that's the lens with which they're viewing the church. Many of you, probably all of us, experience that either in school or work. People know that we're Christians, and that puts you a little bit under a microscope. 
And I really want to encourage you tonight um, to especially be careful in these days and times, not only with what we say verbally and what we do in front of other people, but also with what we post online and the presence that we have there. And I debated about whether to do this or not, and maybe it will work, um, but Mr. Travis is going to help me out up there a little bit. You know, it really doesn't take that much for people that don't know us to find out information about us these days. It's kind of scary. Uh, I teach a class in computer science about um, the last chapter we've been covering is about privacy and privacy invasion. And, you know, there are a lot of people collecting a lot of information about us. They're these little black boxes that we carry around all the time with us, okay? They know I'm at Salem Church of Christ right now. They probably know I'm streaming online, probably know I'm teaching a class about the Bible. So there's a lot they can learn, that people can learn, about you uh, just based on your online presence. And it's really not that hard. Uh, Travis, if you'll help us out, pull that up there. Any person could go and very quickly do a Google search uh, for Salem Church of Christ, which is what I did earlier today. And you can see that without doing any manipulation to Google or anything, we are the first link that pops up if you search for Salem Church of Christ in this area. So go ahead, Travis, if you'll click on that link for me. This is our website. Many of you may or may not be aware that we even have a website, but here it is. Here's what it looks like. So say you are someone um, in the community looking at, at this congregation. Well, people that are around my age, I can tell you the first thing they're going to do is not worry about hearing things by word of mouth from other people or from, you know, looking to someone who actually goes to church. The first thing they're going to do is go to Google. So they go to Google and they, they Google Salem Church of Christ and here we are. And then probably what's the next thing they're going to look for, do you think? The about section. Uh, what does this church believe? Uh, what's the worship services like? What are their, their teachings? Then after that, probably what are they going to look for? The minister. Okay, here we go, Travis. Minister. So you go to the staff section, click on minister. Whoa, there he is. The man himself, Andy Kaiser. Okay, We've got this nice little bio about Andy here. And so the person that's my age reads this bio and they say, hmm, seems like an interesting guy. I think I'll hop over to Facebook and look for him. So that's what they do. And so they go to Facebook and they go to their little search bar in the top left up there. And they type in Andy Kaiser. And then they scroll, 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 scroll. And that took us how long? <laughs> Three minutes to get there from not knowing anything about the ministry at this church. You need to really stop and think about what it is you're putting out there, folks. Because it takes that long to find out. Remember those unintentional consequences? Um, you may post something you think is really funny. I'd be politically motivated. I'm going, stepping on all the bad preacher things tonight, Bill. Hitting politics and we're in religion, so. So you, you post things about your preferred political preference all the time. You're the minister of the church. What do you think someone that's of the other political party is going to say when they search for the minister there? Probably not going there. You need to think about what it is that you're putting out there both in action, words, deeds, social media. You've got to be aware. You've got to be vigilant about these things. All right, thank you, Travis. So we need to be really careful about what we put online. One of the other things that we mentioned was a great thing about the church is the way that we work together and the way that we simply just get things done. And I can't think about that idea without thinking about 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So let's turn there. We're familiar, again, with this, this passage. Um, beginning in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about and makes the comparison of the body with many different members. 
He says in verse 12, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would make not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? And as it is, there are many parts, and yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. For if one member suffers, all suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And as Christ has appointed the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administration, administrating, and various kinds of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a more excellent way. All right, he spells it out there for us. If we're going to be great as a church, we have to work together. We have to find a way to work together, and each of these parts has its own unique responsibility. You know, my responsibility not tonight um, became to try to lead this class in, in some discussion about the Word. Maybe somebody else in here can't do that or thinks they can't do that. They can do just as well as I could. But, you know, they don't have to, um, and that's a good thing. Um, there, there are a lot of things that need to be done that have to be done, that must be done, um, in order for the church to function the way that it should. What, what thoughts do you guys have on that? It's kind of like what you were talking about earlier, right, with love. That's, that's the very next section, right? It's, what, it's what's binding. You move to Philippians 2, uh, 1 through 11. You know, uh, be of one body, one mind, one spirit. So we all have to, to work together in these things in order for us to accomplish our goals. And there are many things that can be detrimental to the church. Uh, we're, we're quickly running out of time, I believe. But, you know, one of the things that, that people like to often bring up is hypocrisy in the church. That's something that can be detrimental. Um, bad examples for members in, in the public eye can be something that's de detrimental. A failure to forgive other people or to hold grudges for a long time. It can be something that's detrimental to the church and its reputation. So we have to be careful. We have to really think about these things. You know, there are, are many things that we can do to help maintain the church and its greatness, its presence, um, especially from the view of the members within and the non-members without. And maybe one of the most often overlooked things that we could do is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, mentioned several times throughout the New Testament especially, but we need to pray more. We need to be in prayer more for each other. We need to be in prayer more for the people that are around us and the community that's around us, along with our love, along with our relationships that we're building, along with the truth that we're teaching. We need to pray for these people and ask God uh, for, for help in these situations. 
So many of our ideas tonight have kind of revolved around the idea of love and showing some love to others and things that, that we can do to spread love and to control ourselves. And I think that maybe the most important thing that I almost always come back to in, in teaching Bible class and, and reading the scriptures is this one idea. And it's the idea of selflessness. You know, if you want a general overarching rule for what makes the church great, it is selflessness. Not selfishness, selflessness. And if you stop and think about all the sins in your life, usually they can be traced back to some selfish intention or desire. And all the good things that come from your life can almost always be traced back to a selfless act on the part of someone else or on your own part. So maybe we could think about those things more as we move throughout our week this week. Kind of told that story about Chick-fil-A, so we'll end with Chick-fil-A. Um, you know, people look to Chick-fil-A as this, this great franchise and this great business model and this great opportunity. And I don't know if you know anything about the guy that founded the place, but his name was Truett Cathy, and it originated over in Georgia. And Mr. Cathy was unfortunately not a member of the church, um, but was a member of the Second Baptist Church in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And oftentimes was quoted as saying that he used the Bible as a guidebook for life. And where do you think these principles that Chick-fil-A was founded on came from? The very same thing that we hold to today. So, I want to ask you, if Chick-fil-A could become widely accepted, popular, thought of as a good thing in the world, why can't we as a church today? I really appreciate your comments. Thank you for the time tonight. We'll see uh, Brother Andy back next week, hopefully.
We'd like to welcome you here tonight to Salem Church of Christ. Our first song of the evening will be 753. 753. <clears throat> Tempted and tried, we're off me to wonder why it should be us all the day long. While there are others living about us, never molested the wind wrong. Father along will know all about it. Father along will understand why. Dear of my brother. We'll understand it all by and by when we see Jesus coming in glory. When he comes from his home in the sky, then we shall meet him in that bright mansion. We'll understand it all by and by. Father alone will know all about it. Father alone will understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. 683 will be the invitation. 683. It's good to see everyone this evening. Uh, as you know, Andy's uh, away speaking tonight, and Justin is gone to pick up uh, John and MB at the airport coming back from Thailand. So, uh, I'm filling in tonight. <clears throat> look at a few verses if you want to look at them with me from Exodus chapter 3. We'll start there. Exodus chapter 3. We'll read verse 11 and 12. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. God had chosen Moses, as we know that story from childhood, to go and lead the people out of Egyptian bondage. And this conversation, Moses is asking, well, who am I? Out of all the people that are on this earth, why me? Why did you choose me? Moses, we know, was a very meek very humble man. Numbers chapter 12, verse 3 says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Who wrote that? Moses did. God had Moses write about himself being humble. <laughs> we find that ironic, maybe. Maybe even a dichotomy. I got to write about myself being humble. But God wanted that in Scripture. He wanted mankind to know that about this man, Moses. And we can see that here. Moses is thinking, there's other people I know more qualified. There are other people better than I to carry out this task. But God says, no. Moses says, well, I'm nobody. I'm just a shepherd. I'm not a dignitary. I'm not someone that's important. I'm not a good speaker. God has that covered as well. Chapter 4, verse 11, God says, well, Who's made man's mouth? I will be with your mouth. I will teach you what to say. Verse 14, God gets a little upset. Verse 14, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Moses found all his insecurities. Moses found all his fallacies, all his excuses that he could come up with 
not to do this task. But God kept telling him, you're the one. You're the one I've chosen. Many times we can find excuses to get out of something. God has work for us all to do. When we use what we have, God blesses it. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 2, God asked Moses, what's in your hand? And we know Moses had that rod, that staff that he used with the sheep. Moses answered, I have a rod. And God says, throw it down on the ground. And when Moses threw that on the ground, it became a serpent. God's demonstrating your power, his power. I'm with you. What's it going to take for you to have the confidence in yourself to do this? And we know he ultimately chooses Aaron to go with Moses, and Aaron does some of the initial speaking. But we see Moses grow into that. We see Moses take over in that conversation with Pharaoh. What has God supplied you with that he can use? Don't let excuses keep you from doing the work of the Lord, whatever that is in your life. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be a widespread event. Maybe it's as simple as helping on Thursdays when they carry the meals to uh, our members, the Meals on Wheels program we have. Maybe it's as simple as serving cookies at VBS, decorating. I don't know how to decorate. I'm not a decorator. Can you hold something? <laughs> how many of you have been in the house doing something and think, man, I wish I had somebody here just to hold this? Help me get this up. Help me hold this while I... It could be an eight-year-old. As long as somebody's got a pair of hands, I can use. There's work to be done in the kingdom. Maybe it's sending cards to the sick or mailing invitations for a gospel meeting or just inviting someone to Sunday worship. God has given you something in your hand and you need to look and see what it is instead of trying to find an excuse not to use it. God's also extending his invitation tonight. You have an opportunity to be restored to the Lord, return to faithful service, to repent of sin, to confess sin. You also have the opportunity to be baptized, to become a member, to start your, walk, your life with God tonight. If we have anyone who'd like to respond to the invitation, we ask you to come now as we stand and sing together. I am I no more. I am I no more. I've been bought with blood. I am I no more. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is. Some of you may can correct me on this because our connection wasn't very clear, but uh, Bobby Rayburn called me this afternoon and I understood it to be Johnny's brother, Robert Davis, but is that right? Okay. So Johnny Rayburn's brother, Robert Davis, passed away today. So some of you may know him personally, and let's remember that family. <clears throat> also, Chuck needs some help setting up tables and chairs uh, for Sunday for our meal together so if you're able to do that uh, meet an activity building and also miss louiva um, many of you may have already heard she has shingles so let's pray for her and hopefully she can be with us sunday 
And uh, personally, I wanted to send out a, a thanks to Carl, Larry, and Justin, who's not with us tonight, but uh, those three did a lot of work on the floor, uh, going down the hallway and then the hallway to the left, uh, laying down a new flooring. Uh, so we appreciate that. And also Carl and Larry, uh, you're going to notice Sunday in the activity building, we got uh, new floor wax on it. So they stripped it and got it refinished uh, the last couple of days. So it looks really good. So thanks to them. Sir. Jim and J uh, Jaden. Jaden, okay, thank you. 604. The closing song will be 604. <clears throat> you may have your worldly pleasures, your silver and your gold. You may pile up all your riches that this old world can hold. But I'd rather have my Savior than with him firmly stand. For I won't be ready to meet him in the glory land. I won't be ready to meet him by and by. I won't be ready to meet him in the sky. Oh, I want to be more like him and with him first a man. Oh, I won't be ready to meet him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all of our many blessings. We especially thank you for this time that we've been able to come together and in the middle of life's busy uh, busyness uh, to open up your word, to study from it, to sing songs of praise and honor unto you, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that we've been uplifted, that we have been strengthened, that we might be able to go back out into our daily walks, that we'll encounter those around us, that we might be able to set forth a good example to, that they might be able to see you living in us and, and see the need for you in their lives as well, Lord. We just thank you for for all those who are are willing to teach and, and preach the gospel, that they will continue to to do so, that they might uh, continue to preach the truth, and and that your word might continue to be spread, Lord. We just pray for those who are not with us tonight, Lord, that they will know that they've been missed, whatever their hindrances may be. We pray that as we're about to depart, Lord, that you will use each and every one of us with our different abilities to to be instrumental in carrying out your will lord we just pray that you'll guide us and direct us and uplift us and and we pray lord that when opportunities arise that that we will take advantage of those opportunities that we might be working for your kingdom lord please forgive us when we fall short and it's in christ's name we pray amen